Hi, my name is Dave. Today I'm going to show you the perfect amateur telescope. And it's at least close to perfect and experts would agree that the ideal uh, beginner amateur telescope, if you're only going to have one, is going to be a Newtonian. You get the most bang for your buck with the Newtonian. Uh, it's inexpensive, uh, gives you enough aperture to give you good images of the moon and planets and double stars and maybe even deep sky things like galaxies and so forth. It's portable. So those are the characteristics that you're looking for. This telescope meets those specifications pretty closely. So this is about a six inch telescope in a, about an F7 focal ratio, the longer kind of a focal ratio. The F7 focal ratio of this telescope, the long, skinny kind of a telescope, means that the secondary obstruction inside here is also very small. The small secondary makes the optics perform better. Uh, the smaller the secondary that you can get away with, the better, generally speaking. It gives you less diffraction, higher contrast. So this scope will perform nearly as well as a refractor, very close to a refractor, about a five inch refractor. Many experts would recommend uh, at least this size, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe a, an 8 inch or a 10 inch in an f6 or so. Remember, as you get up in aperture, bigger diameter, you're also increasing the overall bulk of the telescope and the mass of the mount and everything that goes with it. So there are a lot of compromises involved here. This telescope is very lightweight. The whole thing weighs about 25 pounds, so it's easy to pick it up, take it out in the backyard in one trip, no problem, easy. A commercial scope similar to this, 6 inch F7 or so, 6 inch F8, will weigh about 10 pounds, 12 pounds more than this, so around 35, 38 pounds, something like that. An 8 inch F6 will weigh more than twice as much as this. It's quite a bit heavier scope. It's almost certainly for most people going to be two trips out the door to take it out to the backyard. And it's considerably bulkier. It's quite a bit larger. Notice the way this one's constructed. I deliberately cut away considerable material here that really was unnecessary. It wasn't important to the structural integrity of the telescope. So I cut away all that material to make it a little bit lighter. But notice how I kept the base nice and heavy. The reason is you want, the, you want it to be bottom heavy. You want it to be not have a tendency to tip over. One thing you do insist upon is a parabolic mirror. Everything here is made by me, with the exception of the optics in the finder and the secondary mirror. This, this is a Dobsonian telescope goes side to side, up and down like that. Very nice. A long skinny Dobsonian like this has a problem with balance. Notice how this one seems to be in perfect balance right now. However, look at all the stuff I've got on the front. I've got, in addition to my finder here, I've got a nice heavy eyepiece and I got another finder here. In order to make this effective, you have to have a way to adjust the balance. So here I've got this cradle, which is grabbing the tube by friction. Okay, so that squeezes on the tube and now it'll stay where it's balanced. If I change things, if I remove that, uh-oh, I'm out of balance. Whoa, I'm really out of balance. But I can simply adjust for that. Loosen up the cradle, slide the telescope forward till it's in balance. Whatever I put on the front here, no matter what, I'm, I can always balance the scope within reason. Tighten it back down. Now I've got a scope that's perfectly balanced again. Very easy. Manufacturers would cure that problem with friction nuts and bolts or counterweights or other elaborate mechanisms, uh, spring-loaded things here that does the job it also increases the friction here you want this thing to be so precisely balanced that the motion is very easy 
both up and down and side to side. You want it to be just a fingertip. Push it. Either way. Because you're going to be moving very, very slowly to track celestial objects. You also have the freedom to, with this uh, assembly, you have the freedom to rotate this around. You can put it on the other side if you want to. Put it down lower. Put the eyepiece down lower. Bring it up to the top. However you want it to be, that's the way it will be. All you have to do is rotate the tube. Very, very nice. This is what the cradle looks like when it's dismantled. Nothing much to it. It's very simple. I don't know why more people don't build telescopes like this. Notice this telescope stands up at a nice convenient height for a person that's uh, an adult. Of course you can rotate the eyepiece so you can make it perfect for a little kid too, at least at a lower altitude object. Uh, also you can make this a very portable telescope, a much more compact telescope. Sliding this tube down makes it into a very convenient little tiny package. Here's a lid for it. It will store in a closet pretty nicely like that. Here's what the secondary stock looks like. The only tricky thing about this stock is that when you want to adjust it, you have to put a wrench in here. So you put the telescope down so it's uh, essentially flat, so you can't have any chance of dropping the wrench. You put a wrench on that and then you can loosen it up and turn it to where you need it to be. Luckily, you don't have to do that very often. This is an updated version of the scope that I made recently for my son. I made this a few years ago. This one is uh, over 30 years old. I made this about early 1990s. Um, this one is much more recent. It's made with commercial parts, but you can see it's the same exact thing. And when I made this, I updated the structure of the base. You'll notice I think it looks a little bit more rakish. It's got a taper to it, which I like. I also found that you don't really need two bolts up here. You can get by with just one to adjust the tension on the, on the cradle. It's the same exact cradle, except it only has one bolt instead of two. This scope is made from a, a standard commercial scope. I can't remember exactly where I got it, but it was commercially made. It's got a really nice um, kind of a traditional spider there to hold the secondary mirror. It has a real Rack and pinion focuser on it. The bearings here are just, uh, I think those are four inch drains from Home Depot. Cost a couple of bucks each. Those are just chair glides down there. And of course, all this other stuff is all just standard hardware you can buy from Home Depot. So making them out here was absolutely easy. This is a commercially made six inch F8 telescope. I'm not sure quite where I got it. Uh, they're still fairly commonplace. One of the reasons is that they're very easy to manufacture. You can make a good quality 6-inch F8 uh, for a fairly low cost, and manufacturers like that. It's great for the consumer as well because you're almost guaranteed you're going to get a good quality telescope in a 6-inch F8. On the other hand, an 8-inch F6 or bigger, faster, shorter focal length telescopes, those are harder to make and there's more likelihood that you're gonna get one that's not quite right. Here are the two scopes that I built entirely from scratch. The views through these scopes are superb, not necessarily because they're premium quality optics, because they're not, but because I made them myself. They are extremely enjoyable for me to use. So here's my mirror making setup, at least part of it. Uh, you have some Coudé masks, like so. These go over the front of the mirror. This is your mirror stand. The mirror stand will uh, tilt back and forth, and of course tilt side to side. And then you have your Foucault tester, and this has been modified somewhat over the years. But the basic idea of a Foucault tester is to be able to very carefully move the position of the knife edge, and you can adjust, you can move it this way, in this way very very precisely with these screw adjustments. Foucault tester is just a straight edge. Here's the slit. There's a, a light source. 
The only reason for the prism here is just to redirect the light source to get it out of the way. So you get a flashlight here. There's your light source. There's a slit, narrow slit, and a straight edge. That sits on here. Should be mounted more securely, of course. And then you can get back over here, look through the mirror. And this distance should really be about oh, something like eight or nine feet, something like that. So you're back here and you're looking uh, carefully at the mirror. That's how you do it. So let's diagrammatically represent the mirror with this. I started out with a sphere. This is, of course, extremely exaggerated. So I had a good spherical mirror. Let's assume that's a good sphere. And now you want to parabolize it. So you need to change that sphere to something that looks, and this is again a terrible exaggeration, something like that. Well, in the process of making this, which is a parabola, it's very, very common for you to have too much friction going on over here at the edge. And a little bit of the edge got flattened out. That's a turned down edge. So the shape is beautiful, a nice, perfect, perfect parabola all the way across there, except for those little tiny blips over there. Now, the best thing to do in that case is to go ahead and just, I black those out. You can mask them off, bevel them off, whatever you want to do. It's a quite a common mistake. Uh, but as long as your, your curve is good here, you're fine. I've got, instead of a six inch, I've got a five and three quarter inch beautiful parabolic mirror. This is the book I used when I made my mirror, at least one of them. It's a really good book. Very nice, practical, hands-on type information. Especially about how to make a mirror. Figuring a paraboloid, this kind of stuff. Here's the final, final test that I did. Um, and it turns out I have a mirror that's really, really good. Until you get to the outer edge. <laughs> It's a 15th, a 10th, 20th wave, 10th wave. So it's a really, really nice mirror over most of the mirror, except it's a one wave <laughs> at the edge. So you just paint out the edge, ignore the edge. It's only about an eighth of an inch anyway. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at the perfect telescope. Thank you very much for watching.